Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. Believe it or not, we are now ten deep into John Gardner. Last time we talked about his License to Kill novelization, which I found to be a underwhelming adaptation of the film screenplay, and prior to that we talked about Win, Lose, or Die, which I found kind of dull and meandering, so I had honestly given up hope of ever liking any one of these books again. I thought that that car of joy had uh, well and truly been kicked off the cliff and wasn't coming back. But hey, I guess that car was actually Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and grew wings that is soaring to new heights because I'm actually going to be quite positive about Broken Claw and to be perfectly honest I spent about half of my reading experience wondering if this was going to be my favourite of all of the John Gardner novels so far. Interestingly the plot of this one seems to ignore the events of John Gardner's License to Kill novelization, which is kind of weird. I'm not sure if that was something to do with the, the order in which they were published. Maybe Broken Claw was well on its way to being completed but they had to stop to release License to Kill in order to time with the movie, something like that, uh, I don't know. Or maybe the License to Kill novelization is just not going to be a part of John Gardner's canon from now on, which makes it seem even more ridiculous that he jumped through the hoops he did with that book in order to make the novelization fit in with both the film's continuity and his own literary continuity. But anyway, Broken Claw begins with Captain Bond annoyed at the lack of interesting assignments in his life of late, because I guess once you've saved the lives of Thatcher, Gorbachev and Bush all at once, every Everything else seems dull in comparison. Anyway, Bond is in Canada on holiday and he's doing his usual thing, you know, grumbling about afternoon tea and how bored he is, and uh, he's leaving his hotel and he becomes <laughs> really interested in this bloke who is just there. Um, these are the passages, actually, where Bond describes um, seeing this man for the first time. Bond did a double take as the striking figure moved towards the roles, turning slightly as the nervous young man with the chauffeur came forward to greet him. So interesting was this man that Bond almost missed the next series of events. The man was well over six feet tall, nearer six three or four, broad-shouldered, erect, and from the way he moved, in very good physical shape. You could practically see the muscles ripple under the expensive, meticulously tailored double-breasted grey suit. His face was even more remarkable than his physique, dark, almost olive-skinned, with a broad forehead, fine flared nose, and a mouth that could have been perfectly sculpted by an artist. Thick, sensual lips, but which were in flawless proportion to the rest of the face. The bone structure, Bond thought, was almost that of a pure-blooded American Indian. Only the dark brown eyes gave the lie to this, for they were slightly almond-shaped and hooded, hinting at some oriental blood. Certainly, whoever he was, this fine-looking specimen could never be forgotten. The man in question is Li Fu Chu, a wealthy philanthropist, who is also known as Broken Claw, as he has a deformed hand. He is half Native American, half Chinese, and there is an entire chapter dedicated to Bond following the guy around, being like, Good lord, have you, have, you, have you seen this bloke? Isn't he, isn't he something? He follows him into a gallery where there is a kind of unveiling going on and there's lots of press attention and whatnot, and to Bond this is a seemingly random thing. Obviously to us, Broken Claw is the title of this book. We know that this guy is going to be coming back in a big way, but it's really weird that Bond is just so entranced by this man, and Gardner keeps bringing it up, like for the first third of the book, every time Bond thinks about Broken Claw, he's like, Good lord, what a, what, what, what a man. And Gardner must be aware of how strange this all is, because there is a, a passage of the book where Bond is talking to M about this encounter, and even M is like, so you just saw this man and became super interested in him and started following him around? <laughs> I guess it's supposed to be sort of leaning into the idea that Bond has a kind of a sixth sense for interesting people, bad people, I, I don't know, something like that, but to be honest, it came across as almost like I thought that John Gardner was going to be going for some kind of bisexual subtext for a good chunk of the book, or oh, god, even bisexual text, I don't even think it's terribly subtle. It doesn't pan out that way at all, but for a little while I was thinking that John Gardner was going down some very unexpected progressive route that I, uh, that really caught me off guard. Anyway, after this experience, Bond is sent by M to San Francisco, and the west coast of the US is very much where the majority of this story takes place, and I find that interesting. This book is releasing in 1990, and obviously Russia, uh, Eastern Europe is in this huge state of flux. Uh, things are happening very quickly, and I suppose that Gardner is removing James Bond from those Cold War politics so as to 
you know, Gardner could write something and then by the time it's released, the, the state of the geopolitical landscape would have changed so much that it could be irrelevant. So, okay, we're just going to ignore that completely and move over to the US, which I think is a really good idea. Once Bond gets to San Francisco, he checks into his hotel room and then he goes for a little stroll and he realizes that he's being tailed. And I really enjoyed this chapter. I thought it was quite gripping of him being followed around the streets and the alleyways and then the man tailing him is set upon and killed and Bond witnesses this. Then he is taken in by the FBI as it turns out that the man that was tailing him was actually an FBI agent. I'll just say now, I was super intrigued and into the opening chapters of this book. Dare I say, I was completely hooked, actually. The introduction of Broken Claw was very impactful in the way that I don't feel any previous John Gardner era villain has been, and all the stuff with Bond being, you know, uh, tailed, and then the tail being killed. Um, I really wanted to know more about what was going to happen and how these things were going to link together. So Bond is taken in by the FBI, and then M is there too, and Bond is initially quite annoyed with M because he's been withholding information from Bond. Bond doesn't know the exact purpose for why he is in San Francisco, and M actually does this a lot in John Gardner's books. It, it happens a few times where he deliberately withholds information from Bond, and I guess it's a way of teasing out the necessary information for the reader rather than dumping it all up front, but I, I feel like it's just one of those Gardner tropes that I'm getting a little bit tired with at this stage. Obviously it has nothing on the double crossing trope, but don't worry, there, there is some of that in this story as well. Anyway, some scientists have been kidnapped and Bond must team up with a CIA agent named Chi Chi Su to investigate. The missing scientists are working on a submarine detection system known as Lords and the Antidote which is codenamed Lord's Day. And I love how at one point Bond is like, oh my god, Navy stuff, I literally just did that a couple of books ago. And then it's like, no, 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 bear with us, Bond. I swear it's not going to be a repeat of that. It just felt like John Gardner reassuring the reader that, no, 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 don't don't worry, we've, we've done the whole Navy story. This is, it's slightly related, but it's actually going to be a, a different thing. Bond and Chi Chi Su are to go undercover using code names that were intercepted as being used by two agents from China who are meeting with whoever kidnapped the scientists and stole the technology to purchase it for themselves. And no prizes for guessing that yes, indeed, Broken Claw is the man responsible for all this. I found that the plot got going at a much slower pace than in previous Gardner books. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing at all. Much of the first half of the book is dedicated to describing Broken Claw and Bond meeting with Chi Chi and there's a character named Wanda here who is undercover as Broken Claw's lover and there's a drama with her dad who owed Broken Claw money and I did actually find all this stuff really engaging and like I say, I spent the first half of this book thinking, wow, this might well be my favourite Gardner book of them all. And I think a big reason for that is that Broken Claw is a really great villain, and dare I say, probably the only great villain of the Gardner era so far. I've mentioned this in other videos, but I don't think that John Gardner had quite the same knack as Ian Fleming for introducing really interesting, well-described, villainous characters. I find Gardner's to be kind of vague and, well, under-described. I mean, even just thinking back to the previous stories, the ones that, if any, have stuck in my mind. I guess I remember the, the guy from the first book, License Renewed, because I kind of imagined him as this, like, troll-looking creature. He was quite vividly described. I'll remember Blofeld's daughter and her ice cream magnet husband <laughs> until the day I die, because what the hell. And then I suppose I remember Tamil Rahani, or whatever his name was, because he was in two of the books and he was the head of Spectre, so that's memorable, but I couldn't tell you anything about the character. Thinking back to the other ones, and bearing in mind I've read, you know, some of these in the last year, I, I can't actually remember. I, I read Win, Lose, or Die not that long ago, and I cannot for the life of me remember who the main villain was. There, there were a few double agents, right? Oh god, I need to go back and watch my own review. Here on the other hand, I thought that Broken Claw had a really great introduction. We learn a lot about his backstory. I think he's got a very interesting backstory. He has an imposing presence. And at this point, about halfway through the book, I'm just really looking forward to he and Bond like meeting um, in person. Uh, he is by far my favorite villain of the John Gardner books so far. 
or at least my favorite for non-ironic reasons. I love you, like I say, Blofeld's daughter and her, <laughs> and the ice cream guy, like, that, they're never leaving me. <laughs> Once Bond and Chi-Chi are sent to Broken Claw's base, things become a little less interesting for me. Gardner spends way too long describing, um, this trick that Broken Claw has where he has this base and Bond arrives in his room and he sees scenery outside, which you know, he's like, oh, we could never have made it there in this shorter time. And it turns out that Broken Claw has screens um, just on the outside of the window so he can change the scenery. It can display different locations to where the base actually is. And nothing much comes of this, but again, just a, a trope of John Gardner. He loves describing his tech. I'm sure that he went to some kind of expo and saw a very impressive big, uh, you know, digital display and thought, oh, I'll use that in a story, even though nothing much comes of it in this particular one. I found Broken Claw's motives to be slightly lacking too. I mean, he's trying to get these submarine plan things um, because he's actually working for the Chinese government but he also has his own scheme it is revealed to bring down the stock market and cause financial chaos but barely any space is really devoted to that at all. I, I guess it's there just so that Broken Claw doesn't seem to be entirely a tool of a foreign government, but I don't know, I, I don't know if you really needed these multiple motivations. Anyway, once the mission gets going, it actually wraps up quite quickly. I mean, there are some tense bits. Uh, Broken Claw has these wolves and he intends to torture Bond with the wolves. He's like smearing his crotch with this meat smelling substance and the wolves are going to attack and bite off his crown jewels, I suppose, and um, you know, I don't want to get too Freudian with this, but I could link back to my theory that there is some kind of bisexual subtext going through this book. But Bond is saved by a, another character who we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, the FBI and M sweep in, but Broken Claw makes his getaway, and I did find it quite funny that M is giving it all like, oh, this Broken Claw chap, he's the most wanted individual of both the United States and the United Kingdom. It is imperative that he is captured. The fate of the Western world is at stake. Oh, but look at that, it's the weekend. Everybody meet back here at nine o'clock on Monday. I just found it really funny that they would break for the weekend, but it's it's a contrivance so that we can get to this next section of the book, which is, you know, the contrivances don't end there. So like I say, Broken Claw has escaped. Broken Claw is still out there. And Bond and Chi-Chi head back to Chi-Chi's apartment her known apartment, which seems like a really bad idea. And then they suddenly seem like they're in love or something, which is a development that came about quite quickly. Um, and they're having dinner and they decide that they want to have wine with their dinner, but there's none in. So Bond goes to the shop to get it. And sure enough, upon his return, Chi Chi has been kidnapped. And this is so pot boiler and feels beneath Bond to be so stupid. Uh, earlier on as well, when M and the FBI are there figuring out what bro where Broken Claw might have gone, we hear Bond's internal monologue. And while M is having his all this, it's really important that we find this man, but everyone break for the weekend. Bond is like, he's, he has this hunch at the back of his mind. He decides that he's going to keep it to himself until he has more to go on in his own words. And it's like, since when did Bond ever stop letting pure hunch work do his job for him? It felt very out of character that he was withholding his hunch for where Broken Claw could have gone. It's very stupid stuff, but it does get us into the climax and Gardner is clearly very keen to have this be a one-on-one -on -one thing between Bond and Broken Claw so I guess this is the reason why Bond doesn't immediately call up the FBI, CIA, MI6 and say, oh, by the way, I think I know where the bloke has gone. But you know what? For all of the contrivances that it takes to get Bond into this situation, this climax with Broken Claw, I did really love, like, what actually goes on here. Bond traces Broken Claw to this Native American settlement in the mountains, and he agrees to a one-on-one -on -one challenge with the guy, which is really gory and wince-inducing, and I tend to read these books on my commute, um, and it was taking all of my strength when I was reading through these chapters, not to just be like, oh, gritting my teeth and, like, you know, looking pain, some of the descriptions. Like I say in, uh, in previous, um, reviews in this series, I think that John Gardner is really good at talking about like, really gory, like, torturing kind of, um, situations, um, and this is no exception. I thought that this 
stuff was all great. It's this ritual that involves like putting hooks through the skin and the back and your legs and stuff. It's just, it, it's really brutal. It reminded me um, of uh, some of the stuff that uh, James McAvoy's character goes through in The Last King of Scotland, if that's not too much of an archaic reference to make. But it is really brutal, really good stuff. I just wish that Gardner could have had a more, you know, natural uh, route to get to this point. Because like I say, at this point, there have been about two or three different sets of contrivances that I'm like, ah, I'm not buying this. But sure enough, Bond wins and Broken Claw is killed, so he is reunited with Chi-Chi for whatever that's worth. This is another one of those instances where I think we're supposed to think that Bond's relationship with Chi-Chi is elevated. It's more than just a, a one-off fling. There's actually some kind of love involved here, but I found it completely unconvincing, and I think a big part of that is that Chi-Chi makes absolutely no impression. <laughs> on me as a character. Which is par for the course. I feel like Gardner writes all of his Bond girls with the same voice. Um, and again, I don't expect her to come back. So the fact that Bond is willing to go through such like horrific permanent body scarring during this challenge with Broken Claw to save her seems off to me, but okay, whatever. Okay, so there is also another big prominent new character who runs throughout most of this story that I haven't mentioned yet, but he's intended to make a big impression, I think. And indeed, Bond owes this guy his life at one point. Um, this is Ed Rushier, who is a commander with US Naval Intelligence, and he is shadowing Bond and Chi-Chi and eventually becomes Bond's best friend or something. It's very odd. Again, I'd be surprised if this guy turns up again in the future, but despite only knowing Bond for a few days, he's seemingly very willing to put his own life at risk uh, for him by the end of this story. I will follow you to the bitter end kind of thing, which uh, is a bit odd. I guess that he's there so that, you know, we don't have Felix Leiter in here, but he is kind of Bond's friend in the US intelligence agency that he's working with, so... Okay. Just as an aside, I do feel that Bond has a lot more assist in Gardner's books than in the Fleming books. In the Fleming ones, yeah, Felix pops in and out every now and then. He's, you know, Bond is working with other people. But in the Gardner ones, I feel like oftentimes, you know, the big agency will come in and help out at the end. Uh, and Bond often has allies in whatever intelligence service he's working with. Um, he's often paired up with a female agent who ends up being the Bond girl or whatever. M is flying about all over the place getting involved in the missions. Uh, it, it, I don't know if I like, you know, because a big reason why I like kind of the setup of a lot of the Flemings is that it is this one man going out on his own to save the world. Um, and all of these colourful, you know, characters he meets by getting himself into these situations who aren't necessarily from the same line of work that he is. And Gardner, I feel like Bond is teaming up an awful lot more with uh, other agencies, which, uh, I don't know, I do think you lose something with that. But another big positive for me regarding the story, um, I loved how much of it was set in San Francisco. Um, it really worked for me, and I don't know if that's just because uh, I had a holiday to San Francisco last year, and so I actually knew of a good few places that Gardner was describing. Of course, this book is being published in 1990. It's not too far removed from, you know, today. Not, not really. Um, so, you know, Gardner is describing places, and I'm like, oh yeah, I, I, I know there. He talks about, um, Girardelli Square at one point, and I'm like, oh, I went there, I remember there. So, I, I don't know, maybe I was just enjoying it because it reminded me of a lovely holiday that I'd had, but, um, I genuinely did enjoy a lot of the location stuff in this one. Um, even Broken Claw's base, um, and everything, I had a really good sense of place of geography, which I don't often feel like I get with Gardner. So despite some of the what I would call lazy developments um, towards the second half, I genuinely had a really great time with Broken Claw. Um, I was really into this villain, um, despite his plot being a bit by the by. When it comes to my overall Gardner rankings, I'm actually I'm going to go as far as ranking this one second, like seriously, because of how much I loved that first half of the of the book i thought it was really gripping very interesting and yeah i think broken claw is god probably you know my favorite you know not not even just villainous character of the gardener era he might well be my favorite just character other than bond outright of the gardener era i thought it was yeah 
really engrossing, uh, and I looked forward to <laughs> delving into a new chapter, which is something that I cannot often say about Gardner's books. Let me know what you think about this book in the comments section below, particularly if you think that I'm being a bit too over-enthusiastic about it. Uh, I'm looking forward to next up, we have The Man from uh, Barbarossa, which I'm quite looking forward to because that was the book that uh, John Gardner... Uh, said was his favorite of his own run. So I'm quite looking forward to getting into that. While you're below, you can also click the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button. Stay super up to date on future video uploads and there's a variety of links to my various social media pages below as well. So do follow me on those platforms if you're on them. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.